Hello everybody and welcome to my YouTube channel, uh, Demon Red Mist here. Um, I'm on GT Sport at the moment and one of the reasons I'm on GT Sport doing this live stream is um, to try and help out a few of the Dynamic GT League uh, drivers uh, or anybody else actually that may find it, uh, this video useful. What I'm going to try and do here is try and show how I practice for the Dynamic GT League races. Now, in all honesty, for, for people that have known me for a long time, I don't put anywhere near as much practice into DGT League's races than I did with Formula Sim Racing or Front Row Racing uh, or Forever Relentless Racing. Um, and that's, ju that's just a personal thing. I'm doing DGT League for, for fun. Um, so I approach it with a very um, basic attitude uh, as to how I'm going to practice and to how I'm going to pick a car or uh, work on setups on a car. Um, so what I'm going to try and show here is how I um, go through my selection of which car I'm going to use for each race uh, and then what setup changes I'll make uh, on particular cars. In all honesty though, I literally change arrows, gears, and that is it. Um, I, I'm not touching anything else unless the car requires it. But to be honest, because I don't want to spend a long time working on setups, if the car needs it, I'll probably look at a different car. Um, because if it needs though that much setup change, it's probably going to be because of too much understeer, too much oversteer. That's going to be hurting the tyres increased tyre life, I'll just go and pick a car that's better on tyre life that I'm more happy driving. Um, now when I do eventually get to the track, it's going to take a few minutes, um, I am going to need to do an audio test um, because I'm on a new headset um, on this broadcast for the first time and I've had problems with it. I've got a, a Turtle Beach PX24. Now I had the PX22 fucking brilliant until uh, it broke the px24 audio quality is amazing i can hear myself perfectly but there's problems with other people hearing me so for all i know you might not be able to hear me now especially as the cars are now thrashing around the track um so yeah so i'm gonna uh do an audio test and then i'm gonna really get into um into what I'm trying to do um, to try and help out a few of the Dynamic GT League racers in picking a car, uh, how to work on the setup a little bit, and then how to uh, try and improve the pace around the racetrack. Now I'm just trying to find the link for the video I'm doing. I'm on that now, so I'm just going to put myself on mute for a second. Okay, well, from the sounds of it, um, you can hear me uh, on the live stream. Uh, if if you're watching, if you're not, you won't know anything about this. Um, okay, so I'm going to get uh, straight into it then. And first off is um, setting up a practice lobby. Now, for any of the drivers, if you want to know what the lobby settings are, just ask the admins uh, on the Dynamic GT League Facebook page. Or you can have a look at what I'm about to do now, because I I didn't ask them, but I, I'm pretty sure I know what the settings were anyway. Uh, okay, two things. If you want to practice on your own, undisturbed, then on your PlayStation Network, when you sign in, or even on your XMB menu, change your online status to offline. If you do that, when you set a room up, it doesn't show to anybody. So you can then practice in peace and quiet, all on your own, uh, with the correct lobby settings. If you don't want to do that, set up an online lobby, but set it to friends only, because you don't want a load of randoms joining. Okay, uh, I'm going to click on create new room. Now I've saved the lobby settings to make things a lot easier for me, so I'm going to load them up. And then I'll show you what they are. Uh, if going from top left, practice endurance race, friends only. Room name, I've just named it test because it's for my own purposes. Race for fun, fixed room ownership. Yes, I could turn that off. Um, I will do actually, um, okay, I can't, um, I was going to turn it off in case I did practice with other people, 
maximum number of per participants. I put it down to four um, because I wanted to limit how many people could join me and that's when I found out about being able to be online as offline and not be seen. Okay, select the track, which is a good bloody point. It would help if I checked exactly which track it is. Now, this is also leads me to something helpful. If you want to know what track is coming up next, have a look at the Dynamic GT League videos, um, the race videos, because when the points are shown at the start and at the end, it does show on there which tracks are going to be used. So that's what I'm going to have to go and do now. Uh, so bear with me one second. Oh, can you tell I wasn't really prepared for doing this today? I woke up and thought, mm, you know what, I think I'll go for a drive. If Robert Kubica could do it, so can I. Oh, it almost sounds like a song. See if I can get James to sing that one as Yoda or something. Um, okay, so let me just have a quick look. Because there is a few variations of uh, tracks. So Alsace Village is our next track. Now, I will have driven on the circuit. Um, but I can't say I know it off the top of my head. Uh, oh, for a second then I thought I didn't have it. Right, okay, so pop it on our Sachi Village. Now for the time and day, I've been trying to go around midday, but on some tracks they haven't got it. So um, the time of day that you pick can have a big difference in what the grip feels like. So if you want to know exactly what settings it will be, ask the DGT admins. I will tend to go for something either bang in the middle of the day or um, earlier in the day where the track might not be as warm and might not be as grip. 40 minute time limit, grid start, fastest first, slipstream strength weak, boost on weak, visible damage on, mechanical damage no, fuel off, tyre wear times 5, uh, grip is low and then race finish 30 second. Filter category by group 4 and then make sure you put balance of performance on for DGT league practice because balance of performance will be on in the races. If you don't turn it on you're going to go hell of a lot faster in practice than you are when you actually come to the race. Um, no tyre limits um, uh, put on but you can use any of the racing tyres so um, yeah and then pretty much everything else is to your own pleasure really I mean I don't have any ghosting or wall collision penalties on or anything like that it's just practice um, okay and then create your room it's as simple as that now when it comes to um, picking the car obviously there's quite a few different cars in each uh, class the group 1, group 2, group 3, group 4 um, and some cars are going to be more suited to one track than another but I do know quite a few drivers like to keep the same car, um, regardless of the track. And that is absolutely fine. You just have to understand that your car at some tracks may be really good, and at others, not so good. But in DGT League, you can switch your cars, that's no problem. Now, if you are someone that does like to switch your cars like I do, it does mean that I come to this track now having no idea which car I'm going to use or which car may be the best. Um, because it is a track that has got a lot of different types of corners. It's got slow and twisty. It's also got high speed, high camber. Um, so working out which car to use might not be too easy. But I'm going to show you uh, a couple of the processes that I use. And I approach it kind of scientifically in a way not that I apply science it's just the scientific principle of when you're going from one car to another keep parameters the same then you get a more balanced view of what cars are like uh, that will I'll show that better in a moment okay as you can see I've got a number of group four cars here um, so it take me a long time to try every single one now admittedly I know what the handling characteristics are like of most of the cars so I already have an idea of which car I probably would use in the race but I just need to check what I'm gonna do here though is I'm actually going to pick a car that I know is a little bit tricky to drive and that's the uh, McLaren this McLaren um, is a little bit understeery, but also a lot oversteery. So it's a little bit of a tricky car to go with. But I'm going to jump in that to begin with, um, so that I can just show a few things. I'm going to pick that car. Now, what I'm, one of the first things I'm going to do is turn traction control off. For the tyres, choose the racing soft tyres. Right. 
in all honesty, when qualifying comes around, yeah, use the racing super softs. But you're probably not going to want to use them in the race unless your car does not like the soft tyre. If you are going to practice using the super soft tyre, remember two things. One, make sure you put the same tyre on every car you, tra you test. Otherwise, your, your practice parameters are, are changed. So keep it with the racing super softs. Also, secondly, after the first lap, your lap times are just going to get slower. So even if at first you're going faster on lap 2 and lap 3, it just means that your lap 1 wasn't good enough. The tyres wear so fast that they are going to go slower and slower and slower. So it's very difficult to get a consistent idea of what the car handles like and what it may need. That's why I tend to go with a racing soft tyre. They'll tend to last a good 10 minutes on most tracks in most cars. If it's bad on the tyres, about 8 minutes, but that's enough time to give you 3 or 4 decent laps to know what you need to do with your car. So keep your tyres the same anyway. I'm going to go racing soft. Everything else is default, or should be. Okay, I had changed the right height a little bit, but I'll remember that. Okay, so I'm going to restore everything to default. Uh, aerodynamics, gears, I mean that's not changed anyway. Um, okay, and then I am going to put the fully customised gear gearbox on and I'm going to leave the speed at 174 when it comes to the gears to be honest most of the time I only change it on the max speed um, rather than trying to change it anywhere else but at the moment we've now got the McLaren on its base settings and I do this at every track I'll default it all to, um, to base because the cars handle differently at different tracks so what I'll then do is, I'm going to go out on track now, but there's only one thing that I want to know when I go out on the track. So this is my order of process when it comes to practice. Right? Um, and that is, what's the fastest speed I get to on the fastest part of the track? Nothing else matters when I first go out on the track. It's as simple, I want to know how fast I go on the fastest part of the track. Because that will then dictate what I'm going to set my gears to, and that's the number one thing to work out because if your gears are wrong you're going to be slow you're either not going to be fast enough on a straight to overtake or your gears are going to be way too long and you're not going to be able to get up to speed quick enough yes okay there are benefits of having a longer gear ratio um regarding um wheel spin however that's only in your first what one two three gears so there's no point having four five six really long um but anyway now in the bottom left corner as well, I want you to just have a quick look at the max speed, acceleration, braking, corner and stability. That there is a key part of how to pick a car as well. Whether you want speed, acceleration, braking, cornering or stability. When you change the tyres, it will affect those graphs. So compare that to different cars. So this car's acceleration is 4.9, which isn't too bad. Its max speed isn't great, its braking and cornering is alright. And the stability at 6.1 might seem alright, but Steve's Audi that he uses is about 7.2. Um, very annoying. Um, so yeah, so use that as a guide as to uh, whether you, the car inherently is better in the corners or better in the straights. Anyway, okay, so I'm going to go out onto the track with one simple aim, and that is to find out how fast I go on the fastest part of the track. Nothing else really matters um, at this moment in time. Okay, so looking at the track map, now, if you can't hear me, by the way, because this is a loud fucking car. Um, I will do. An, I will check the audio actually in a second. Yeah. So, looking at the track map, um, there's a potential two places of high speed. One of them is where I'm approaching now. Um, this left-hander should be close enough to flat out at racing speed. So that's a possible high speed bit, however, I think, oh, I'm looking at the track map, uh, however, I think it may be later around on the circuit, but like I say, nothing matters other than finding that moment that is the highest speed. So this is another quite fast part of the circuit, but it's not going to be the fastest, I don't think. Now, while I am driving around, although nothing else matters, I am just getting a general feel of what the car's like. 
is it a little understeery is it a little feisty on the rear end in the corners get an idea of whether I'm below third gear a lot or not because that gives me an idea of whether it is a lot of low speed corners or whether like this corner it's high speed depending on where you decide to apex the corner now for me this section should be the fastest part on the track I think down into a horrible little hairpin so that's potentially the fastest part of the circuit now I didn't have a look at how fast I was going then but that's because I'm just working out where the fastest part may be so on the next lap I'm gonna really focus on it there's got a fast downhill section but it's into a horrible couple of corners so I doubt that's gonna be the fastest part of the track And this start finish, yeah, it's not going to be the fastest part. So I do think it's going to be uh, the part of the track map that's sort of uh, the bottom left of the track map in the top corner, up to the uh, hairpin on the left-hand side of the circuit. Um, so uh, let's see what sort of speed we get up to down here. Now I know that this car's got seven gears. By the way, I think somebody is watching at the moment. If you can't hear me, uh, feel free to mess your uh, comp look message that on the chat and I'll check that in a moment if you can hear me call okay so that wasn't up to a very high speed now you see that I'm not driving particularly cleanly but to be honest it doesn't matter at the moment because all I'm interested in is uh, the high speed part Ooh. And what I tend to do as well, I mean, these couple of laps that I'm doing now, I'm not concentrating much, but this is all just going in the memory bank um, of where the track goes, just getting used to the rhythm of it, so that I don't even have to think about it later on. Okay, I need to try and get this corner right, so I can get the most top speed on the exit of the corner, onto what I think will be the fastest part of the track. Now, it doesn't matter what happens, in this corner down here because I'm going to be looking at the speed so when I'm about to break okay 133 mile an hour right that's all I need to know now while I'm just heading back to the pits I'm just going to check my audio and make sure that I can be heard because if nobody can hear me there's no point me fucking talking uh, during um, the laps Okay, audio test complete. Uh, I can be heard. Right, okay, so I know that the top speed I got up to was about 133 mile an hour. Now, to be fair, with the Group 4s on uh, balance of performance, that is around about the maximum you're going to get, somewhere between 132 and 140, depending on the nature of the track. So, number one thing to do, check what top speed you get to with the gears on the manual sequential gearbox, nothing else changed, and see what speed you get to. Okay, I got to 133 mile an hour, so there's no point me having my gears at 174, so I might as well knock it down to 149, is probably where I would go. That might still be a little bit too long, but I've got to consider excuse me i've got to consider um being in slipstream however looking up at the graph in the top right corner of the gear ratios i can see that seventh gear is already very very short so i could shorten each individual gear but at this time i'm not going to do that because adjusting the individual gears is 100 percent relevant to the track you are on you want to set that up so that you're not having to change gear in the middle of a corner when you should be either on the brakes or on the throttle. Um, so now I've lowered the gear ratio, I'm just going to go back out. Now, what I'll do this time is see how close I get to uh, VMAX, maximum speed, um, in the fastest part of the circuit and see if the gears do need to come down a little bit more. If they do, I'll knock it down. 
Then comes the scientific bit again. A lot with like with the tyres, where you use the same tyres in each car in every little test you do. The gears will be set to the same on each test as well. So when I go from this car to another car, it will be on super. Uh, sorry, it will be on the soft tyre, and the gears will be set to whatever these gears are set at. That way, you get a direct comparison from one car to the next of which is handling better, which may be quicker, which may need more work. Now by reducing the gear straight away, it's gonna make the car accelerate a little bit quicker, may come at a cost of tire wear, but I'm not worried about tire wear now, I don't care. I'm just gonna be looking for the car that, uh, for me, handles the best with the best lap times as I work towards that. But yeah, so acceleration is going to be a little bit better, which means the lap time is instantly, or should instantly, be faster. So make sure gears is the number one thing you change. Or at least you get set right. Because if it's the difference between being way too low down the revs in a gear in the middle of a corner, compared to a peak point of the revs, the amount of time you can gain and lose is massive. Now, I did say a little earlier on that I know this car is a little bit understeery and a little bit oversteery, so I am sort of driving a little bit cautiously just to get a, a feel of the track. So now that I've got the gear set at about the right range, now I am going to focus a little bit more on, okay, how is the car handling? So all the time I'm thinking, right, am I going too fast for a corner, too slow for a corner? Um, are my gears feeling quite balanced or am I having to change gears a lot in the middle of a corner? Am I getting oversteer? Am I getting understeer? But when you're trying to work out whether you're getting oversteer or understeer, you have to factor in other things. For example, is the car understeering because it's got understeer or because you're going 30 mile an hour too fast for a corner? That's why there's no shame in taking your time and getting up to speed. That's how I do it, admittedly. Other people tend to do it a bit more like Schumacher used to, so I go flat out and, uh, and then come back a little bit. Now you see, I'm trying to brake quite late in a few of the corners, but I'm not able to get down to the right gear. I'm not able to slow down enough for the corners. So I've got two options, increase the air rows or just brake a little bit earlier. But I am finding in the middle of some of these corners, like third gear's too slow, but second gear's hitting the limiter a bit. Or here, fourth gear is a little bit too close to the limiter. But fifth gear may have been a bit too slow and those multiple little changes are all going to compromise your potential top speed. I mean you'll see as well I'm only getting up to 131 mile an hour now. But that's because I'm not being able to carry the speed out of the corners because I'm not smooth through the corners with the gear changes in the speed. And to be honest, while I'm driving, the rear end of the car is, I was just about to say, feeling absolutely planted to the road, and then I get oversteer. But yeah, the rear end is feeling fairly stable, but the front end is feeling very understeery. Right, I do want to try and get to a higher maximum speed than 131. You know what, that was very close to the limiter there, so the high speed part of the track might have changed a little bit. But this is a corner, I'm struggling a little bit fourth, it doesn't really want to do it in fourth, it doesn't feel right.
There's the understeer coming in again, so I braked a little earlier, but still got the understeer. So for this car then, if I want to move forward with this car, I need to do something about the understeer that I'm getting. There it is again, as I'm wanting to get on the power, the understeer is just costing me. So I'm going to finish this lap and then I'm going to show you what I would do regarding the understeer. You'll notice I'm not changing the gears. Even though I'm, I've said that the gears, I'm not very happy, I'm not going to change the gears. I'm going to keep the gears exactly the same in every car until I've decided which car I'm going to use and then I will maximise the gears individually if I need to. So all I'm interested in now is the understeer, the oversteer, but making sure that I'm not driving too fast. Understeer again because of the understeer I'm trying to turn more while getting the power down and that's what's causing a bit of the oversteer okay so now I have a benchmark lap time a two minute four uh, that's a benchmark lap, lap time however the understeer for me is now a bit of an issue in this car now as I said a little while ago with the setups I don't go into too much uh, detail with the setups you'll notice as well my max speed on the left hand side has now decreased obviously that's down to having changed the the gear ratio but there's no point having the gears at 174 when the top speed is 133 okay so the understeer I could go at looking at a lot of different parts of the setup now initially though I would literally just go straight to the aerodynamics. I'm just going to need to get a drink down and gone. Now, there's two ways to to look at the aerodynamics. One is in a logical sense. I've got understeer, so I'm going to increase front downforce. Now, when I change the downforce, I tend to go in increments of 10 or 15. That's just what I do for simplicity's sake. If you're after perfection, you're not going to get that here because, as I said at the start, I don't put as much time into practicing this as I used to in other series. Um, okay, so yeah, logically, you could just add more downforce on the front end and see if that helps with the understeer. But as I also said, you have to know why the understeer is happening. If the understeer is happening because you are braking too late, going too fast into a corner, steering too much, then adding downforce isn't going to help you. You need to slow down, brake earlier, and then see if you're still getting the, the understeer. Um, so yeah, if you can, try and work out why it is you're getting the understeer or the, or the oversteer um, before you go changing the errors. But anyway, so you can change it logically by increasing the front aerodynamics, or... You can do it um, in the backwards way. And this is something that, uh, for anyone that doesn't know about this, it's something that's going to seem a bit weird, but it does work. Not all the time, but it can work. If you're having problems, give this a try. Um, instead of increasing the front arrows, decrease the rear arrows. Right? By doing this, you would you change the balance of the aerodynamics so the front could be sliding because the balance is wrong and there's too much um, aero on the front so if you add more wing you could make the problem worse however by losing some rear downforce you effectively make the front aerodynamics more powerful without changing them that's the process um, and to try and hopefully give an example of that, I'm actually going to reduce the rear aero by 20. Now, this could get a little bit hectic in this car. So now, having reduced the rear arrows, and I would do that with this car straight away, because as I was driving round, the rear end did seem very planted, but the front end was understeering. So rather than bolt on loads more uh, front wing, I'm going to loosen up the rear a little bit to try and keep high speed, um, and help with turning. So let's go and see if that has helped. This is where I end up crashing in every bloody corner, but it's a simple way of um, trying it. Now, if this didn't work, 
and I still had understeer and a load of oversteer, I'd simply put the rear back to where it was on the 500 and then increase the front a little bit. So straight away good test in this corner because it's high speed into a heavy braking and straight away much better turning which is going to allow me to have much better exit now I'm going to purposely be pretty aggressive on the throttle because I want to know whether the rear can take this or not that's what she said um, yes yeah, so I need to know now I braked later than I did previously in that corner but still managed to make the corner this occasion so by loosening up the rear it has made the front end of the car much more stable much stronger but only if I drive it properly now this corner will be a test for it because obviously it's a high speed corner now you may think I'm taking an odd line through that turn tip for you try and apex it at the end of the curb on the right if you apex earlier you ain't making the corner unless you slow down oh cars twitchy now under braking under heavy braking there but already the car is feeling more balanced more flowing through the corners the gears all of a sudden feel a little better I'm not having to change mid corner so I've not had to change a load of things, I've changed one thing and it's affected what how the front end's handling, how the gears are handling much tighter through that corner, no hint of oversteer Now I'll drop down to second there if you want, stop, rewind and play. I did it for a reason, every other time I've gone through that corner in third gear and it's felt a little slow. This occasion I went through in second gear, bouncing off the limiter. So that tells me that if I was going to use this car, I may have to make second gear a little bit longer to help me through that corner or make the third gear a little bit shorter. So as I'm driving round, I'm not going for ultimate lap time here. I'm not even thinking about lap time. I'm just thinking about, okay, how's the car handling? If it's handling good, shocking English there, Dave. If it's handling good, the lap times are going to come anyway. So I'm only focusing on um, how the car's handling and where I'm trying to position the car. I'm also thinking what fucking livery is Steve going to have on his car at the next race so yeah apex at the end of the curb it's going to run wide but it's right on the limit I braked a little early for that corner with it getting a little bit twitchy but even I saw then one and a half seconds up and all I've done is reduce the rear wing now I'm getting a little overconfident now pushing a little bit harder but that one little setup change is allowing me to do that. I'm now feeling more comfortable with the car. 1.8 second gain. Okay, third gear this time, and I'm I'm waiting. I'm waiting. It feels a bit slow, but on the exit it's pretty good. No oversteer. So if I was going to change that gear, I would shorten third a little bit. If I go for lengthening second, there's more chance of getting oversteer in the higher rev range. Now as I do push a little bit harder, I may find that the car's going to struggle a bit more. But it's feeling so much better through there, nearly flat out. So 
So I am now, I am pushing the, the boundaries a little bit. And the reason for that is I'm trying to work out, okay, would I be happy with this aero setup as it is, or would I be better off actually with a little bit more wing? So that's what I'm going to try and do. I'm also going to try and apex the early part of this corner. Okay, now I'm slowing down and I'm having to slow down to stay tight. Now I'm running wide. Ooh, nearly didn't make yet, yeah, not making that. So just by apexing that corner early, can't make the corner. So make have a look at apex in that corner late. Okay, I'm not going to complete this lap. But obviously, you'll have seen there the gain I've made just by one simple setup change. I don't know why, I just slap my fingers in my palm as, as, like, as an expression, because nobody can fucking see it. Okay, so as I said, I was starting to push the boundaries there of what the car was capable of doing. And the reason I was able to do that was because I was much happier with how the car was feeling, all right? with one simple change. So then as I'm starting to push the boundaries, again, I'm not thinking about lap time, I'm just thinking about how does the car feel. Now, for me, it was a hell of a lot better, but it was still a little slidey. So now, if I decide, oh, actually, I want more aerodynamics on the car, it's very, very simple. Keep the gap the same. So I know that the rear on 500 is very good, um, maybe a little too good so I could put the rear on 490 and then increase the front by 10 and that keeps the balance then so now so effectively the balance of aerodynamics on 480 and 200 was very very good had very good turning seemed to have very good traction so I want to keep that balance so whatever I change the rear by I will change the front by the same to keep the balance. Now I am going to go um, to 500 and 220. Um, and the reason for that is sometimes you have to be very, very careful. By the way, feel free to keep an eye on the left hand side as to how much the max breed acceleration and stuff like that uh, details are changing. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons for this is if you do put too much aerodynamics on your car not only are you going to limit your top speed but you're going to overwork your tires so if you're using the super soft tires instead of getting one hot lap and then a second lap that's a little slower and then a, and then it going off you're going to get one hot lap and the second is going to be diabolical because you're working them too much so this is why you have to try and keep a mind on why you may be getting understeer. Because, for example, I could go from 200 downforce on the front up to 220 and get lots more understeer. And it'd be very easy to go, well, how the fuck is that happening? I've got more wing on it. It shouldn't be doing that. Well, if it's too much force for the tyre to take, it's going to understeer. Now, that is where you could, if you wanted, go into looking at the toe angles, the camber angles, and all that stuff. But as I said at the start of this video, that's not what I've been doing. I've just been keeping it very simple. Now, you will have seen, perhaps earlier, that the front ride height on this car did change when I restored the defaults. And that would have been uh, set up specific as well uh, for a particular track um, to either try and aid the... Uh, turn in or even just the rake angle if you don't know what rake angle is it's lower front higher rear angle of attack free downforce be very careful going extreme with that okay so i'm going to go with 220 and 500 now and bear in mind i still don't know if i'm going to use this car or not i'm just doing this with this car to get a base lap time so when you do come to do if you're going to try sort of copying this so to speak Pick the car you think you're going to want to use for the race and get your base lap time and then pick something else um, to see how that compares. Now, bear in mind, you probably will have to go through exactly the same process with that car as this car, but it may be worth it. So rather than jumping in a car, taking it for two laps and going, oh, I don't know, and then jumping in another car and taking that for two laps and going, oh, I don't know, be a little bit more methodical about it. Okay, so 
Now I've got a feeling that this is going to be much better in a couple of corners. Excuse me. But may also struggle in some. Now we saw what benefit reducing the rear wing had. Now I would hope that the balance of wing is going to be pretty much exactly the same. But just that in some of the higher speed corners I'll be able to push a little bit more. And in some of the lower speed corners the car will be more stable on the brakes. Not that I will be able to brake later. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for stability under braking. So braking at the same point and the car being much more balanced allowing me to drive out of the corner faster. Slower in, faster out. Okay, so as I'm driving around now, I mean I am on a wheel by the way for anyone that doesn't know me or what I'm doing here. Uh, I am on a Thrustmaster T300 RS steering wheel. Um, so I am ha just simply feeling for how the car is handling. And I can already tell through a couple of corners that the car is much more planted. Much more stable. This will be a good test. So much later on the brakes, I know I said I'm not going to go later on the brakes, but I wanted to test it in that corner. I broke at that point earlier on and was all out of shape, but I was much more stable on this occasion. So now I know if I was going to overtake into there, I could push it late, but not too late. Now you may notice as well that while I'm driving I am trying to keep things nice and smooth so I'm braking once. I'm trying to accelerate once but sometimes I will blip the throttle a little bit but then I'll get to a point where I'm on the throttle and I don't lift it off again. Now this corner I couldn't take flat out earlier fifth gear trying it this time it's gonna make it though so braking earlier for that corner and tighter into the apex earlier on to the throttle so for that corner I'm not benefiting by braking later and trying to go faster I'm benefiting by braking earlier and just leaving the corner faster Tiny lift, I'm pushing it round here this time, but the arrows are holding it. Now that's going to be a tyre killer in a race, but I've come through there so much faster now. Still pushing it a bit too much in the braking zone. getting a little too overconfident with it pushing it a little too hard but there's nothing wrong with pushing a bit hard in practice just make sure you're aware that you're doing it and you can come back from it okay so 1.1 second gain probably could have been a second and a half had I not got a little too eager so from start to this point now I'm what two and a bit seconds faster than I was at the start and all I have changed is the gears and the wing nothing else now if I was going to stick with this car I could improve on that I could go okay well you know what towards the end of that lap the car was getting a little bit understeery as I pushed it a little bit more now that could be because there is a little bit too much aero on the front end so I could work on this car if I wanted to um, or more than likely it will be with this particular car lowering the front end uh, by 10 will reduce that amount of understeer that I was getting so that's probably what I did at a previous track 
but I don't know if another car I've got is going to be better than this one. But now I've got what I would call a happy benchmark. So I would then test other cars to see if they are potentially better or worse. And once I have gone through those cars, what I would then do is return to this one and change nothing. The reason for that is I've driven for, what, 40 minutes maybe, however long it is? By the time I've tested four or five other cars, I will have driven for probably another hour, maybe. That is all additional lap practice on this track that I didn't have when I drove this McLaren. So if I go through testing the other cars and then come back to the McLaren, so if I've tested other cars and I've gone faster, how do I know if that is the car or the fact I've learned the track more? There's only one way to find out. Jump in the car that you first used and give it a try. If you then go faster in the McLaren, well, whichever car you pick, you know it was because you've learned the track more rather than it being the car. So this is where the sort of scientific approach or scientific method um, is beneficial for you by keeping the tyres the same, the gear ratios the same. Um, starting with the setups on default it gives you a baseline to work from um, but also I will just mention I'm pretty sure if you download um, other people's liveries be very careful because I'm pretty sure for example if I went and did a livery and dropped the suspension to the deck when you apply that livery to your car it will drop your suspension to the deck so you might think that you're on a default setup, but actually you might not be. And there's no guarantee that people have set up a car nicely um, or that you will find nice when you drive it. Okay, right. Now that I have uh, done a few laps in that car, I am going to change car. And now this is to try and um, show a little bit about what I was on about with the, what's in the bottom left corner here. So with this car set up as it is, max speed is 5.4, acceleration is 5.4, braking is 3.5, cornering is 3.5 and, and stability is 6.1. Having done a few laps around this track, stability is going to be important. There is a few difficult braking zones where with changes of direction and there's a lot of camber. So you're going to want a car that's got a bit of stability about it. Acceleration will be useful because there's a couple of slow corners, but to be honest, most of it is medium to high speed. So you're going to want a car with decent straight line speed. So, for example, the Renault Megane Trophy may struggle around here because of its lack of top speed. But at the same time, that car is phenomenal in corners. And I'll actually go to that next. I might not drive it, but I'll show its stats. So, yes, 5.4, 5.4, 3.5, and 6.1. So let's have a look at the Renault, just to, just to show you. So looking at this, okay, so racing soft tyres, and then looking on the left-hand side, right, max speed is 0.4 less. The acceleration is 0.1 more. The braking and cornering is 0.4 more, and the stability is 0.2 more. So that, for me, says that car will be a hell of a lot better all of the way around this track. It may struggle in top speed, but it's going to be so good through the corners, people shouldn't be able to keep up with you, unless they've got their car set up right. So it's, this is an interesting car to pick. I know I tried using it, I practiced at uh, one of the tracks earlier in the season, and to be honest, it was 1.8 seconds off the pace. Um, so it was like, okay, can't use that car because it was such a high-speed circuit. Um, however, Nürburgring that we did last night, um, it struggled on straight line speed, but it was so dominant in the corners, it, it, it wasn't a problem. You just had to pick and choose where to overtake. Now, for anyone that's interested and wants to see what setup is on this car at the moment, feel free to pause screenshot um uh this is the setup i used at the nurburgring um now with this car as well one of the things that i tried to do with this car was reduce the aerodynamics to try and increase the maximum speed um but what actually happened was i didn't get to a higher speed 
I just went slower in the corners. So I ended up reverting the downforce to 205.15. And the reason for that aero setup on this car is because it is a little bit tail happy. Um, so you do have to sort of look after it a little bit. So effectively, this car has got understeer dialed into it to try and stop the rear end from sliding out. Um, that's how I look at it anyway. Um, the front aero is at a lower balance than the rear. Um, the gears, I did tweak about with the gears a little bit for Nürburgring. Uh, and that was um, corner specific. So as I mentioned about this track we're on now, turn one um, at the top of the track map, I was trying it in third gear and it felt a little bit too slow. But second, it was bouncing the limit. So at the Nürburgring, I did just tweak those gear settings. Right. I am just going to jump into another car though, um, let's see, I'm not going to try the Evo though because that is a car that needs work, that car understeers like, I don't know, like a bus on ice um, and I haven't yet fully worked out how to um, get the maximum out of it, um, but let's see. Which car should we go for next? You know what, I'm going to go with the uh, the Aston Martin. Um, because I know a few people in the DGT League like to use the Aston Martin. Um, so I'm going to jump in that. Also, it might give people a, a bit of an idea of um, a base sort of lap time. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier on, same tyres that you used in the previous test. Now, if you don't want to restore your defaults, you don't have to. It's just personally, I do. Um, now, okay, with the Evo, I said that one's a bitch, right? When I get that one sorted out, I won't be resetting that to default because it'll be a nightmare to get it back again. So some cars you will have to go, you know what, I'm not touching that. Um, but for the purposes of what we're doing in our races, I have no problem in resetting them to default because I just want a direct comparison, that's all. Um... Now, I know that the Aston Martin, it's, uh, it's an interesting car. So without even driving it, straight away I'm going to put the gears down to 149. That now is at the same gear ratio that the McLaren was on. It doesn't matter that the McLaren had seven gears or that the Evo only has five gears or if you're in an electric car, it doesn't matter. Setting your max speed the same means effectively the car should get to the same speed. However, if it doesn't reach the same speed, you know it's not as quick in a straight line. And if it goes faster, you know it's better in a straight line, but may not be quicker in the corners. Now that may mean that you will have to adjust your gears afterwards, but that's not a problem. Now with the Aston Martin, from the driving that I've done in it previously, I do know that this car is a little bit tricky because it is, uh, I found the more I tried to push in it, the more understeer I got. But it is, at some tracks, a very oversteery car. Um, so it can be a little bit difficult to perhaps suss it out. However, I would literally use exactly the same process that I just used um, with the McLaren. So now in my practice process, it's as simple as I'm going to jump in this uh, Aston Martin, go out on the track, have a drink of coffee first. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say I'm going to focus on lap time. My aim is to try and beat the lap time that I've done, but I'm going to try and do it by focusing on, okay, has the car got understeer? Has it got oversteer? Um, what corners am I struggling in? Rather than how fast am I going? Because the speed will come if the car's set right. Now with this car, I think this car only has six gears. With this car only having six gears, it could change which gear I'm gonna be in for certain corners. Uh, it could change the rhythm so you do have to kind of factor that in so if I approach this um, uh, not this corner the next say fifth gear and go wow I'm flat out in fifth gear I couldn't do that in the McLaren well that could just be simply down to not having the extra gear so I'm going to focus more on how is the car handling 
does it feel better in the brakes? Now I didn't have a look at the stats on the left hand side of the screen. Excuse me. Because at the moment it doesn't matter that much to me. That's more something for yourself to look at if you want a bit more of a guide. I mean I've already done it so I've already got an idea of how to crash into a barrier. Um, I've already got an idea of the characteristics of most of the cars in this particular class anyway. So interestingly, compared to the McLaren at sort of medium speed, medium to high speed, its turn in does actually seem a little bit better. At very high speed though, it wasn't very nice. So medium speed turn in didn't seem too bad. High speed turn in not so good. Because this has only got six gears, first corner is probably going to be a second gear corner. Yep. Uh, Oversteery though, lower gear, higher revs. Bit of understeering there. The car is sliding around a little bit. I'm not feeling the confidence to really push it. This left hander though is feeling very nice through that corner. But at the lower speed, it's not it's not quite feeling like it's got the grip or the balance. And I already know at the higher speed it's struggling on understeer. doesn't like that corner understeering it's weird it's understeering and then part way gripping so yeah it's not quite balanced right probably going to be about two seconds off the pace here oh, 1.1 I am braking a little bit earlier than I was in the McLaren I just haven't got the confidence in this car at the minute Now it would be very easy to go from having driven the McLaren, jumping in this and going, oh well this isn't this isn't better. I'm not gonna bother. Well, are you sure? So don't be afraid of taking the time. I mean I'm not saying spend hours and hours and hours and hours practicing. Trust me, I've been there, done that, and it's fucking annoying if you spend hours and hours practicing and someone rolls up and goes, oh, I've already done any practice and they're seconds faster than you are it's horrible, I know it is okay, just an hour I drove through there, a little le less aggressive so the rear end on acceleration isn't feeling too bad I'm not really suffering with general oversteer So on the brakes, I'm struggling a little bit, mid-corner. I mean, that corner is taking so much better than the McLaren did, but it could just be because I'm going slower. It doesn't like heavy braking, but that is, I mean, one of the characteristics of this car is that it isn't that good on the brakes. Got around you that time, you sod. Now, for any of the guys that do use the Aston Martin, with it not being very good on the brakes, that means in the race situations, you can't go late braking anybody. Because if you do, you're not making the corner and you're not making the overtake. So if you drive the Aston Martin, you've got to approach it in a different way. 
don't attack them on the way into the corners attack them on the way out now you may notice that it would appear that I'm driving slower than I did on my first lap but it's going to be a faster lap than my first lap I hope it was slower yeah, I'm driving slower just to try and balance the car a little bit so that I can get a better feel of right is it understeering because I'm driving too fast and braking too late or is it because the car's just got understeer so in this car it'd be very easy to go oh it's not turning whack loads of aero on the front but that's not necessarily going to be the fix if the problem is that you're braking too late I mean that moment just there you whack a load of aero on the front of this and there's a good chance you're going to make it too oversteering so you've got to be careful at how you're going to do it he really doesn't like the brakes he really doesn't so this is where how you practice is going to be more important than what lap time you can do realizing that the problem this car's having in the corners may not just be the driver is a big part down to the brakes so you get your braking right then you can focus on right what's the problem in the corners is it the driver is it the setup is it the tires now I'm using the same tires because I said that's what you should do and you should but once you have picked your car it doesn't hurt to try it on the different tyre compounds to see if your car works on the super softs or not if it works on the softs or not if it works on the mediums or the hards because there are cars that don't work on the mediums but do on the hards or don't work on the softs but do on the super softs now the reason I'm using the softs is because just personal preference from the races we've done in the Dynamic GT League that the soft tyre is the better race tyre for me okay this car needs a little bit of work now I'm not going to spend ages working on the setup of this car but I'm going to approach it in the same way that I did with the McLaren right. I've got understeer but actually the rear end's not too bad um, if I'm struggling with the rear end there it's probably because I'm trying to overdrive getting around the oversteer so I'm going to approach this in exactly the same way as I did the McLaren and just knock, knock the rear, wen uh, rear, wen rear end down by 15 so I'm going through the same process gearbox, arrows do those in that order first and you get much better comparison from one car to the previous car I'll know straight away, hopefully, whether this change um, improves the front end like it did in, in the McLaren, or if it doesn't work, I'll know, right, okay, I'm going to need to increase the front. If it still doesn't work, and I'm pretty sure at one of the tracks where I did use this car, this one did take a little bit more work, and I will sort of quickly mention, uh, mention it now. If you have played about with your aerodynamic setup and you can't get it to either stop understeering or stop oversteering, put your arrows back to default. Right? And then go to your anti roll bar and read what it says on the right side of the screen. Adjust the stiffness of the anti roll bar, which connects the left and right sides of the car. The higher the value, the stiffer the bar. So, the higher the number, the stiffer the bar meaning that horizontal rolling is restricted that's basically how much your car will lean going around a corner a bit like a bobsleigh man's head as he goes around the corner he leans um, making the front anti-roll bar stiffer will make it easier to understeer so if you didn't touch the aerodynamics but your car is understeering you could effectively reduce your anti-roll bar and that should get rid of a little bit of the understeer it'll have a negative effect that it could cause oversteer if you take it too far 
So you do have to be careful about how much you adjust this setting. Literally most cars that I've tried, one click is enough. Um, okay, yeah, so you could try and reduce the understeer by reducing the anti-roll bar. With oversteer, it effectively works a similar way. Um, while making the rear anti-roll bar stiffer will make it easier to oversteer. So, if you increase and make the rear anti-roll bar stiffer, it'll oversteer more. But, a little bit like the aerodynamics, there's the logical way to look at this, and that's sort of how I've explained it. Front anti-roll bar, higher number, more over, uh, understeer, lower number, less understeer. Right? That's the logical way to look at it. And the rear is higher number, um, more oversteer, lower number, less oversteer. But there's also the backwards way to look at it, right? And some of you may think, you, well, you're off your fucking tits, Dave. You're mental. Trust me, it's it's a way that a lot of setups have worked. It's why you ever listen to any Jensen Button interviews from his F1 days? And he's like, uh, yeah, I need to dial more understeer it, dial more understeer it. And I always just think, why would you want to give it more understeer? Well, it's to, it's the backwards effect of you give it more understeer to make the rear better. Um, so you affect, you change the rear to make the front better, and you change the front to make the rear better. Fucked up on it. So for this car, if I wanted to affect, um, one, if I wanted to reduce the understeer, I could lower the front anti-roll bar or I could increase the rear anti-roll bar making the rear end of the car come around a corner a bit more obviously take it too far you're going to oversteer around corners yeah, you're going to get around the corners but anyway I've only changed the arrows so let's go and do a quick lap here so of the setup changes that I make so far Gearbox number one, arrows number two, and if need be, anti-roll bars. Other than that, I don't bother. Now I could, and I could possibly um, gain a lot more lap time, but I don't want to be sitting there spending a long, 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 long time testing the cars. Because if you think about, if you've got a possibility of 10 different cars you could use on a racetrack, by the time you've tried them all, that's a long time at the racetrack. Then by the time that you've tweaked your setup, that's a hell of a long time at a racetrack. And it can get a little bit boring, and the idea of Dynamic GT League is to be fun. Now, I don't mean to blow my own trumpet, but if I did get into the situation of going down the route of tweaking lots of little bits of the setup and properly practicing, it may be a little bit unfair on some people because, I mean, I've had, what, I don't know, 15 years experience at this. I, I'm not a shit driver. I have on occasion. Um, so, I mean, so I'm not going to blow the old trumpet. I'm fucking blow the old trumpet. Um, yeah, so I'm not a shit driver, so I don't want to over-practice and make it less fun for me because the fun part for me is the race the battle not being a second and a half faster than everybody else and driving around all on my own on a racetrack that's not what i'm racing for i mean don't get me wrong the competitive side of me wants to win but i want the fun of the battle because that's what i've missed from my racing um over the last three years Now, I haven't really been concentrating while I've been driving around here, and one of the, the good signs from that is that the car is handling a lot, a lot nicer. I'm not, I've not had to think about where I'm driving. The car's handling much, much better. But also, it shows that every lap that I've done is going into the... I nearly said wank bang then. It's going into the... Uh, <laughs> it's going into the knowledge tank um, of experience. So now, sort of subconsciously, <coughs> I'm driving without really thinking about it. And when you can get to that point, it's one of the good things about just 
doing lap after, not lap after lap, but doing a number of laps, it, you can get to the point where you don't have to concentrate too much on where you're going, you just go there, and then you can concentrate much more on, right, what's the car doing? Did I break too late? Can I take this corner a little bit quicker? So I don't have to think about the next corner that's coming because it's automatic. Which is all right until you get into the center situation. The Monaco one, I mean, not Imola. So yeah, the front end of the car is definitely handling much, much better now. Okay, we're getting a bit of tire squeal, but I'm not exactly out of control with the front end of the car. I will give a little trick though that I've just remembered that I learned with this Aston Martin. It does help with the braking a little bit. Now, for me it worked, uh, whichever track it was in the DGT League that I raced this car, it worked for me. I'll try and give an example of it on this next lap. I mean, I'm not too worried about lap time at the moment, it's more about the handling of the car. Okay, so for anyone using this Aston Martin, trick for you. Brake, weight, shift. Brake, weight, shift. If you do it that way, the car slows down a little better, more balanced under braking. Didn't mean to spin there, obviously. Uh, yeah, it'd be more balanced under braking. Um, brake, weight, shifting. It's a... It's a style of driving I picked up a, a few years ago uh, with some of the F1 games and I did transfer it into other formulas. Um, it's something that I taught Steve about uh, as well. And on this game from what I've seen it tends to be um, car dependent and it can be very odd getting used to it. But that's why I came up with the brake weight shift. And effectively what you're doing, you're hitting the brakes, you're letting the car slow down a little bit more, then you can change gear quicker. So brake, wait, and then you can pop down the gears. So by the time you get to turning in for the corner, you're not still going down the gears and you're not still on the brakes, you've already got all that done. So all you have to worry about then is where you're going to point the car and where you're coming out of the corner. I mean, the car is handling considerably better. I know the lap time's not going to be there at the moment. But you'll notice that corner, I was able to brake so much later. I'm going wide, though, because I'm driving one-handed. I'm pointing at the screen, not that you can see it. Um, yeah, that corner then, I was able to brake at the kerb instead of way before the kerb because I used brake weight shift. try and concentrate properly for a lap seeing as I was what 16 seconds slower now, admittedly the car's still not quite feeling balanced right but I'm, I'm still just sort of focusing on okay is the front end turning in better yes is the rear end coping for the most part Yes. Is the driver coping? No! The corners where I'm struggling a little bit with the turning, am I still struggling? Are the corners like this one where I had no problems earlier? Am I better or am I worse? I was in a gear higher that time. Still struggling a little bit at the slow speed corner. Maybe still breaking a little bit too late there. Turning definitely feeling a lot better though. 
but here I'm having to lift more than I would want to initiate the turn. I'm gonna have to go down a gear as well. So I would probably do the same as I did with the McLaren and uh, go up with the overall arrows. Great weight shift. You'd be surprised how effective that technique can be. It won't work in all cars, but in some it does, and this Aston is one of them. Trying to push it, trying to push it. It's not liking being pushed. Okay. Now, admittedly, having driven that car for a few laps there, I would probably at this point go, mm, okay, I could increase the arrows on it and it might improve a little bit. I don't think it's going to improve two seconds. Now, okay, I might not be fully concentrating, but personally, this car just isn't quite right for this track. Um, as useful as brake weight shift is, this car would be much more effective somewhere like Monza. Um, decent high speed, long braking zones uh, where you've got that time to hit the brakes hard, do your brake weight shift and all that kind of stuff. So I, at this point, would probably move on because, for me, the McLaren is miles better. So I would, at this point, jump into a different car and go through the same process again. Now, what I'm going to do here, um, I'm only going to jump in one more car and it will be the Renault. And the reason for that is I just want to see um, how good the Renault is around this track. Because this, uh, at the same time as showing people how I practice, this is actually me doing a bit of my practice. Um, so I want to know, is this Renault going to be good enough? Now, out of the cars that I've got, there's the Renault for me. I'll just... Um, while I'm taking a breather and having a drink, I'll go through what I think about some of the cars. The Renault for me is the best handling car. It hasn't got a straight line speed, but it is the best car through corners, which more than compensates for it. However, if you were to take that car to Monza, you might as well not go, because it just ain't going to cope. The Aston Martin is a pretty decent all-round car, but you do need to get on top of the understeer. I have shown you, though, how to do that. The McLaren is a brilliant car, I think, but it is tricky at first. And if you go slightly the wrong way with your setup, I mean, I went the wrong way when I first got the car. I tried um, dealing with its understeer and when it gets oversteer, and I went the wrong directions and made it worse. Um, so for me, when I first drove the McLaren, it was fucking horrible. And I made it worse. Once I'd made it better, it's a lovely car to drive. The Lamborghini, I'm not overly sure about. That's not my livery, by the way. It's one I made for my niece. Dolphin Racing. Um, it's not a bad car. It's four-wheel drive. I don't really get on with the four-wheel drives in this class, though. They haven't got the grip in the corners that I would like um, compared to the Renault. And the Evo is an evil bitch, and I will conquer her. The McLaren, that is probably up there as my second favourite to the Renault. It is a brilliant car, very good in a straight line, very good in the corners, very good on tyre wear, but it sounds very slow. So it's difficult to really judge just how quick you're going, um, but it is a phenomenal car. This Porsche is also a very good car, but circuit dependent. Use it at the wrong track, it's going to be fucking horrible. You could spend a long time working on aerodynamic setups on that car and not really getting anywhere. The Mustang I've never really used um, because it's an absolute fucking tyre killer. Um, I mean, it's not too bad a car to drive. If tyre wear wasn't on, I'd happily use it, but we have tyre wear, so I wouldn't bother. The Corvette. That is a beautiful, beautiful car to drive, but doesn't quite have the grip, uh, unfortunately. Um, so as nice as a car as it is to drive, for me, it just wasn't quick enough. The Jaguar. 
the Jaguar is probably the fastest car in a straight line in this uh, class of cars that I've seen. Um, it is very good in the corners, but it's not overly stable, if I remember rightly. It can be a little bit tricky, but if you get a nice balance to your aerodynamic setup, it can be a very, very nice car to drive. The Peugeot, I don't like it myself. It's front-wheel drive, and that, for me, is a no-no. Um, I do not like racing cars with front wheel drives uh, prefer rear wheel drives uh, I just wouldn't even bother with that the Subaru brilliant probably the fastest accelerating car in this class shit in a straight line but a very very good car if you're on a tight twisty track that is probably close to the Audi and the Renault um, for, for grip and handling uh, the GTR, I've struggled a bit with that, not really got on with it with, uh, with the four-wheel drive on that car, uh, but it is a car that I like, so I do. I need to work a bit on the setup on that one. The Hyundai Genesis, that's a dark horse, just to let people know. It is a very good car, but it eats tyres, unfortunately. It's a brilliant car, uh, very quick. Um, it's a very... Uh, it's kind of like it does everything. It's fast, it's good in the corners, and it kills your tyres. Um, so, very good car, but troublesome. The Bugatti Veyron, not as fast in a straight line as it bloody should be. Uh, but not a bad car to drive. The Megane, I've not bothered, front wheel drive. Uh, that Merc is the same as the other Merc I showed you, and so is the Renault Trophy. Um, okay, so there's a quick run through of the Group 4 cars, from my perspective, anyway. Right, so I am going to jump in the Renault now. Now, my initial thinking of this car around this track should be, if I drive it properly, it should annihilate the lap time that I've already set, simply because of how good it is in the corners. Doesn't mean that that is exactly how it's going to pan out, but it is so good in the co Well, see, with this car... Because the top speed of the other cars that I got to was about 133 early on, 131 to 133, this car's top speed at the Nürburgring was 135, I think, um, but most of the time it was about 133, 134. So around this track, top speed might not be an issue, unless you're side by side with a car that can go faster. Um, but this car should be absolutely fucking brilliant in the corners. So, let's go and see what it's like. Now this is a car that, I mean, generally overall it's got bag loads of grip. But the bumpiness and the camber of this circuit could affect how this car handles as SGP has joined the room. Um, yeah, so the grip of this car, I mean, it is very good. So if it struggles, with um, losing the rear end a little bit of rear wing should fix it learning what I did about this car at the Nürburgring in the reducing the wings to try and bring in a little straight line speed isn't worth it uh, I would probably if it was under steering I would probably increase the front wing I'd go for increases rather than decreases but when it comes to changing the wings I mean you'll notice on both the previous cars that I used I did go for decreases first and it is intentional if you go for an increase first there's a good chance you're gonna get better grip but if you then go to a decrease you've just driven with much more grip so it's just gonna seem worse However, if you don't drive it or you've driven it and then you just decrease the, um, the wing, you'll be able to tell if the balance has got better or not. You get a much better feel for the balance 
and then if you do increase the wing you get a much better feel for the benefit of having the extra wing oh it doesn't like second gear for turn one This corner should be easily flat out in this car, and it is. And I know I'm slower at the moment, but turn one was bloody awful. First car I've been able to go into that corner in fourth gear. tiny lift hell of a lot less of a lift than the Aston much better through the corner but that's to be expected gain four tenths nearly flat out through there None of the other cars could do that. And remember, I haven't touched the setup yet. I got a little bit too aggressive on the steering then. That caused the oversteer and a new fastest lap. So even though I was nine tenths down, through the first sector I ended up with a new faster lap on a car that I've not touched the setup with and now that I'm trying to pick up the pace a little bit the rear ends going uh, so a little bit of oversteer and I don't really want too much oversteer in this car I guess I want the front end to be pointy but I don't want the rear end to be losing the grip now part of it could be because of the gear ratios the gearbox seems very very short I can't really use second gear so I could go for lengthening second gear or just reducing third a little bit but yeah with the rear end I think I would probably just bump up the rear wing by 10 or 15 now what that'll do is it'll make the rear of the car grip better reduce the oversteer but it will take away a little bit of the um, turning ability of this car but that's actually not a bad thing this car does turn so sharp that it's very easy to turn too much and um, take a little bit too much tire life So even through there, second gear is too short to really get the maximum benefit of acceleration. So with this car already feeling like it's handling better, my mind is already going, okay, what would I do with the gears? Because I'm already that step ahead. I've already decided, right, I know what I'm going to do with my wing when I pit. And then after that, I'm already thinking, I already know what I'm going to be looking at doing with my gears if I was going to go with this car. Alright, let's see if we can get a decent lap in. Now looking at the tyre wear, I didn't look at the tyre wear on any of the other cars to be honest. I'm just having a look at the tyre wear on this one because of it handling how it is. slide there because of the sharpness of turning
turned a little too much. That'll carry though. Come on, decent speed out of there. Now I haven't looked at any point what straight line speed I've been getting in this car. At one two nine, I think it was I got then. a bit of time in these last couple of sectors that's because the tires are wearing a little bit the grip is beginning to go a bit not bad though i mean i was a second up in the first sector lost eight tenths over the rest of the course of the lap but i put a big chunk of that down to um down to the tire wear so that car for me straight away now i'm thinking right okay well i've tried two or three other cars the mclaren was the better of the other cars i've tried but this is just trans the mclaren so now i would go right okay adjust that rear wing um change the balance a little bit see how much better it is and that is then when i would go back to the mclaren once i have made this adjustment and given it another run now i'm not going to do that because uh, it, it's kind of pointless um but yeah, I would then go back to the McLaren because I've now had more laps practice. I know how three different cars handle around this track, right? Um, so the things that I perhaps would do in the Aston, as for example, the brake weight shift, I tried doing it in the Renault and in um, the uh, tricky left kink and right hairpin at the fastest section of the track tried it there in the Renault and it was able to break so much better so I'm able to take what I um, picked up from the other cars into each car so it's all knowledge it's all experience so I need to go back to the McLaren to see if that is potentially as quick as the Renault because the second um, that I gained in that first sector is it down to the car was it down to the experience that's what i'll be able to find out now it looks like dgt league sgp is out there on track in his uh thomas the tank engine car now obviously i could have invited him into the chat party but i didn't want to get distracted um now he is uh, obviously there to get a little bit of practice and also that audi has been one of the most difficult cars to compete against and i know that steve was pissed off at how his race went last night um, i think his strategy was something that he was not happy with uh, at all um okay this should have a ah, display all um yeah, so he wasn't happy with his strategy. So this car has the potential of being quicker than the Renault. So Steve will want to come online and show just how quick he is. Um, so let's see how he gets on, shall we? Um, now, while Steve's practicing, I mean, he may practice in a different way to me. I mean, he's on the racing super soft tyre. To be fair, the Audi has been very good on the super soft tyre. But Steve is going to practice slightly differently to me because he's found a car that he is very happy with on a number of different circuits. So when he comes to a track, he hasn't got to spend time working out, okay, which car does he want to use? He knows which car he's going to use. So he's then going to go a similar process to what I did, which is, right, number one, gears. Get your gears set. Number two, wings. Get your wings set. And then you can focus on the driving. Obviously you'll see he's in Thomas the Tank Engine livery as well. I'm not even going to comment on that. Um, but yeah, and Steve's uh, pushing and I don't blame him. I mean, the Audi does handle very, very nicely. I am interested to see what lap time it can do. Well, you'll notice as well there, he did take the later turn in, trying to apex a little later. Let's see what speed he gets up to. He's into sixth gear, 130. He's got a good straight line speed, 133. 
Is he going to run wide? No, he's not. He's doing all right there. Can he take this flat out? In the Renault, I could. No, he's had to lift. So that could be that he's got lower wings on, and when he sees that I didn't lift through there, <laughs> he'll try it. Um, but it could be that his tyres are beginning to wear. But you can think about those things as your laps go on. He's pushing hard in the braking zone. He must have seen a purple somewhere. What's it going to be? What's it going to be? A 203. He might not be too happy with that, but I'm sure he'll have things that he can change. Um, so, yeah, Steve is taking a different kind of practice approach to me. But what I have shown in this video, um, this live stream, hopefully are a couple of very simple, very basic things that you'll be able to do to try and aid um, getting a setup that you can then drive. The driving aspect of improving your racing is a little bit more difficult. Um, it's a little bit more time consuming. Um, it's about um, breaking earlier to get a better entry into a corner, to get a better exit out of a corner, slower to go faster. It's about being smoother. It's about using all of the racetrack. It's about um, turning in at the right point to get the right apex point. That all takes a little bit of time and a little bit of experience and that it will come eventually. Um, but I will, I will sort of try and run through a couple of things while I go and try uh, how my car is handling now I have increased the rear wing a little bit I'm not going to be doing too many more laps though because I do need to get myself something to eat but I, I did offer my services to a few of the DGT League drivers earlier today um, of which I think one or two have taken up, me up on the offer for later this evening but I figured I'd do this video for anyone that doesn't get to join us okay so while I'm driving, I'm going to try and give, if I can, a couple of little tips. So as I mentioned about using all of the road. It's about being smooth, braking once, turning once, accelerating once. Not going off the track. It's about being smart. Just because you're behind someone doesn't mean you have to overtake them at the first opportunity. Think about it. For example, in this car, there's no point in me overtaking someone at the start of a straight. They're just going to drive right back past me. I'm much better off overtaking them at the end of a straight or on a corner, coming out of a corner after a straight and using the remainder of the track to pull away. I mean, something I will say is as well, I mean, if you're driving on a track you've never driven before, there's no shame in putting the, uh, the racing line on to see where the game recommends that you drive. It's not something I tend to do, but I wouldn't hold it against anyone that did. I mean, something you may, well, you may or may not have noticed, in all of the laps I've done, I've not once hit that barrier on the left. Simple reason for that. I know it's there. And I'm not pushing the brakes. I'm not going hard on the brakes or deep on the brakes. I'm not trying to lay brake into that corner. And by doing that, I don't hit the wall. If you hit the wall, you lose time. Play the more sensible game. If you don't hit the wall, you go faster. Less sharp turning in that corner, but now a bit of understeer. A bit of oversteer on the kerb as well. So I may have increased the rear wing a little bit too much.
The thing is, once you've got the balance of your car set and your gears set, you don't have to worry about any of that anymore. You can just focus on where you're going to brake, where you're going to turn, if the setup change you've made is wrong. I must admit, while driving this car, it's sounding slower, it's feeling slower. So it's possible that I've just increased that rear wing a tiny little bit too much and it's thrown the whole balance out. Yeah, I've got plenty of grip in the acceleration. A little bit of understeer in the car now. I don't really want, so I would reduce that rear wing a tiny little bit. Yeah, understeer. And the lap time's just not quite there now. <clears throat> but it, everything that I've done, it all goes towards that adding to the experience, adding, adding to the knowledge. To make changes you make easier to decide what to do which then just frees you up for working on lap times, working on braking, working on um, are you in the best car. Um, I mean, that's something I think some people in the DGT League might find, that they've got a car that they really like driving, but unfortunately it's just not quick enough. Um, and that's the nature of some of the cars on some of the tracks. Um, but it, I know it's very easy to get very angry and very annoyed um, if you're struggling a little bit. I mean, what I would say is, if someone wants help, ask. Worst I can say is, fuck off! <laughs> well, one of the things... I I mean, in my years that I've seen, one of the things that I've seen a lot is people trying to go faster by pushing more. But if the car can't cope, you're never going to go faster. Now, obviously, there may be some people that watch this that go, oh, well, I do a lot more on the setup, and I'm a bit... That's fine. That's fine. I've only done this video, or this live stream, for the basics, for the dead simple stuff to get people started, to show that you don't have to go running through all of the different settings and spending hours and hours on tweaking and testing and tweaking and testing to make a car handle better and to get more out of it. try and push it a little bit now on that out lap the car was feeling a little bit better balanced got a little bit twitchy then I don't mind the car having a tiny little bit of oversteer in it. I'm quite happy with that. As long as I can keep my foot down. Ooh. 
Ooh, pushing the limits there. Break weight shift. I was clipping the wall there. So a one second improvement. And that all come from that balance just being that little bit better, having taken a little bit of the rear wing off. Then I may have just pissed off Steve as well, by the way. I think he beat me lap time until then. Um, so that slight change of balance, I oh, know you hadn't, um, was enough to then give me the confidence to push it a little bit more around some of the corners. Um, so for me, I'm very happy. I know what car I'm going to be using, I reckon. Um, but hopefully I've been able to show that I've been able to get dramatic improvements in lap time with very simple little changes to the car setup. Okay, there is a proportion of it that is down to driver ability and experience, but that comes with time. I'm old. Steve's older, but I'm old now. Um, so I've got experience. Um, but anyway, there we go. Right, I did notice that somebody had messaged um, uh, on the YouTube chat a little while ago. So I am going to have a quick look at what that message was. Ah, Stephen Whitfield. Excellent video. Really useful. It is. If uh, that's uh, Steve F1 and uh, you saw the bit about the Aston Martin. But yeah, I mean... <laughs> Brake weight shift is something that, I mean, I've, I've mentioned it to a few people before, and I mean, I, I know some very good drivers out there that may think, well, oh, I'm talking bullshit, just brake later and you brake the same amount, or whatever it may be. But it's a very simple process that not many people think about or consider, and it's all to do with engine braking. Um, and it can give you much better stability and allow for a much faster um, uh, a much faster um, gear changes going to a corner um, I mean in the Renault at the fastest part of the circuit I was able to attack that braking zone so much more with having a car that was stable for me and by doing brake weight shift um, so tiny little things like that that people may find very very useful also people from the dgt league now have a benchmark sort of lap time um of a two minute uh, i think it was uh what was it yeah two minutes 274 on the soft tire by the way um so people have got a bit of a benchmark of what to go for what i will say though is for anyone that watches this that is aware of what lap time i have just done if you focus on trying to beat my lap time you won't do it if you focus on your car and how it's handling it is possible but don't get disheartened like steve will now don't get disheartened if you can't get um really close to my lap time because in the races there's boost and there's tire wear and the faster a car is the more damaging its tire wear can be um so don't get too disheartened just enjoy yourselves anyway i am going to bring this live stream to an end now um because i've pretty much done all the driving that i can do at this moment in time um and I'm going to need to get something to eat. So hopefully this video will have been useful to, to some people. Um, either way, it's been enjoyable for myself. So I am going to bring this to an end. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. Um, make sure you check out the Dynamic GT League YouTube channel, Facebook page. If you want to get involved in uh, a GT Racing League, check them out. Um, also check out the I'll Tell You What TV um, 
pod uh, YouTube channel for unofficial F1 podcasts. Uh, be live on Tuesday at eight o'clock, and that'll be with me, uh, James Hulkenberg, and uh, Steve. Uh, DGT League SGP uh, will be there as well anyway have a good one folks enjoy your weekend don't drink and drive unless you're Ray and you're doing it on a video game uh, have a good one and I shall catch you later